expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts past, present, or future employers. We're back in the saddle again, folks. It's Breaking Down Security. I'm Brian. Ms. Berlin, Mr. Betcher, join me this week. Yo. Yay. It's just yay. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you want more? I, I mean, Scott said we should have a soundboard. We could like insert clapping here. No, I can't. I can't do. I can't do morning zoo. I. I, no? I told my No, I told myself I would not do morning zoo on the show. Um, Fine. I think I'd abuse them anyway. Ago. Yeah, a long time ago, I was like, yeah, I can't. I can't be like the you know here you know morning shows on radio and stuff. It's like. Yeah, that's it's cheesy. We can look like <laughs> we belong in the zoo, but yeah, and we look like we have faces for radio, but I'm gonna bust out the slide whistle. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> only only sound effects I can make is with my mouth, and that's it. And uh, yeah, so uh, so for those of you who don't uh, who don't listen, you know, or are listening to the show, you think, oh well, they're on again this week. It's actually been what about four weeks since we've been on three, four weeks. Yeah, it's yeah. been a bit. Yeah, things yeah. have things have gotten better. Things have gotten worse. At at the same time, you know, we've got things have gotten better. Well, if you live in the Midwest, the states are opening again. If you're on the West Coast, like California and Washington, as of uh, six May or five May, oh, it is Cinco de Mayo, isn't it? Happy Cinco de Mayo to all of the late Cinco de Mayo. Uh, all of the states on the West Coast, pretty much, I think, are still under lockdown. Uh, and uh, if you live in the Midwest, you're reopening to whatever it is it's going to happen so we will see i don't know we have half and half we have some stores that have been open and now are requiring masks we have uh some places that are continuing to stay closed right um yeah it's it's half and half i guess depending Mm. on what the business decides to do yeah and i've heard that some stores are at least on 5th of may that people were opening those stores but nobody was coming into them and i'm like what's the point of doing that but I hope everybody's safe and sound. I know that, uh, you know, we're not just in the U.S., but it's a, it's a worldwide thing. So whatever country you're in, I hope you're safe. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we'll all get back to whatever the new normal will be once we're done with this. And uh, so uh, we're going to bring our interview on this week. Uh, Masha Sadova, you may have heard her on a previous uh, show uh, we, I was doing some interviews at Source Seattle a couple of years ago, and she came and spoke at the, at that, and uh, it was a really great conference. I'm just uh, unfortunately it doesn't happen in Seattle anymore. So, uh, but she gave a great talk about how uh, people motivate and get motivated, and she's moved on from her previous position to being the founder of a company, which it's like, damn. I'm like, I I. I would love to do that. So uh, maybe we could talk to her a little bit about what it takes to become a founder of a company. But Masha, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here and great to talk to you again, Brian. Right on. So um, yeah, for those that maybe didn't hear that episode, and I'll make sure I put that interview uh, bits in the show notes uh, from from last time. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I am obsessed with the human element of security. It's something that I've been doing for uh, over a decade, I uh, got to security and I was surprised so what I ended up studying in school. Started with forensics, but then they just lock you by yourself in a room with full of hard drives way back then. And that's really lonely. Uh, <laughs> and I became really interested around like, who are these people at the other end of these like cyber attacks? I started working on Russian APT. I'm originally from Russia, so I got to start working on uh, with the Russian language angle, got a chance to look at some of those threats and I became really interested in the human element of, of security and looked at both the attackers and who they were attacking. I got really interested in psychology uh, and had a chance to um, start a team in uh, Salesforce in 2012 that was responsible for addressing human risk in the organization. And I remember asking myself the question, like, what would it look like if people wanted to do security instead of had to? If I wasn't beating them down with a stick and they actually cared to, to step up and be security champions, well, what would a program like that even look like? And I remember being obsessed with this question and finding that there was no answers to that question in security, but there were answers to that question in gaming. 
And there were answers to those questions in positive psychology and also dog training and child rearing and mm. around like, how do you get a dog to sit? Like it's positive reinforcement. What if we apply that to security? And so I started taking all these frameworks from all these different places and started applying them to security and it started working. And so I became really interested in using motivation as a source of improving security posture of organizations. And uh, I started measuring those results. I, I started seeing what would happen to efficient click-through rates and malware and user-generated incidents, and it started working. So I, uh, I started taking the program that I had built at Salesforce and talked a little bit about Lydia O'Brien way back when and uh, started Elevate Security, which is a company who's three years old now, and we are a human risk management platform that is oriented around uh, looking at what people do, not just what they know, and using observed risk to map strengths and weaknesses for an organization, and then using that data to create really personalized and individual nudges for every employee. So think of it like a Fitbit-like approach but for security. So hmm. it's been a wild ride in, in security so far. I, um, I'm, I've uh, definitely been entrepreneurial through and through. Uh, but one of my favorite things is taking unrelated questions like behavioral science and positive psychology and applying it to some of the hardest problems we have in the security space and love to talk about it. Cool. All right. So <clears throat> you, you said you like taking disparate things. So you mentioned training, you mentioned motivations. And apologies, uh, we're hitting a thunderstorm here in Seattle, which is great. I don't normally get that a lot here, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking out the window and going, yay, there's thunder. Um, uh, so apologies if you hear the thunder in the background, but I'm loving it right now. So, you know, uh, most companies in the new, you know, in, in how we work and normally uh, is we get security awareness training and it usually happens once a year and it's a flash video and, or it's a slideshow you click through and then you answer questions that a five-year-old could pass and you call it good. Yeah. Um, I've always been on the bandwagon that that doesn't really help because especially if I don't have to watch the presentation and just answer the questions myself and, and pass with no problem, um, you know, uh, then it's not real good training. If, I was a company, uh, how would I, what would be a quick win for me to, other than, you know, talk to Elevate, uh, would be to improve the training or the security training that I give to my, to my organization? What would be an immediate quick win in this case? Yeah. So this, this is a question that I get asked a lot. And one of the ways that I actually have it asked me as is like, well, how much is enough training? And the thing that I reflect back both to your question and to that question is that's not, that's not the right question to ask. Oh. The real question is what are you trying to achieve with the training? What is the outcome you're trying to get to? And if compliance is your outcome, and, and that is legit outcome, we, we need compliance then make it short and sweet and just sign the policy and move on. Like find the minimum of what you need for compliance. No need to put lipstick on a pig and call it security advancement if it really is for compliance. Uh -huh. Now, if you really are trying to affect risk, then trying to figure out what you're trying to address is the most important thing. So figure out what your top user generated incidents are. I'm going to give you the punchline. It's going to be phishing click through. It's going to be malware infection rates. It's going to be patching and more and more is going to be sensitive data handling. It's going to be the same stuff that's been on, on our radar for the last 10 years. Um, and then finding if what you are doing, you can call it a training. I like to use a broader term, call it an intervention maybe, or a campaign. But the thing that you're trying to put out to your employees, is it impacting the risk in the way you expect it to? We use that exact same logic for a whole bunch of our other areas of security. So when I, when I do scans on, for vulnerabilities in my network, do I, then I roll out a patch campaign. Are my scans, do, do the results show an improvement? Why don't we do the same thing for training? Uh, we just put it out there and hope it works. And it doesn't because everyone does exactly what you just said. Just mute it and brute force the quiz question. We somehow think that's going to be a miraculous solution in getting people to actually defend themselves from from attackers, or maybe we don't, and we just are on this hamster wheel of insanity where we keep trying something that we none of us like or, or know works. Hmm. 
So do, that all sounds great if I don't... The problem is it, it's the training that we get for compliance to check the box is somewhat expensive. Um, it's a hard security ask to go, look, this LMS system that we spent half a million dollars on is not good. What, you know, now we're going to have to spend yet another half a million dollars on a different LMS that does something a little different. Um, how, I think my, my, my question is, how do we know if, how do, how do we evaluate learning management systems or training systems to ensure that we're getting the, our money's worth? Mm -hmm. I don't think learning management system is at the course, the core of this. So a learning management system, hopefully you're not just paying half a million dollars on learning management system just to roll out your security training. Um, hopefully you're using it to host a whole bunch of other trainings for other parts of your department. Uh, if that's the case, please call me and I will give you a free solution um, that, that you can use for a fraction of the cost. Um, honestly, you could probably just send out a DocuSign or something like that and meet your compliance with the oh. exact same success. It just need people need to acknowledge best practices. That's what, that's what people, that's what the policies say. Um, so what, just to take a step back and rethink how, how you need to be approaching the problem. So I would separate compliance as one problem set and acknowledgement of that. And it could be an LMS, but I encourage you to think about it outside the box. And then human risk mitigation is a different category. And the steps that I would recommend you do that is let's take one behavior that's top of mind. Let's start with one. And let's use, we'll call it fishing because it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. Uh, and you can either take real fishing or you can take mock fishing. Everyone can run a mock fishing test. You can go to go fish, put out by duo and run free tests. Um, or if you have real fishing, say you use a proof point or whatever, start pulling the data to see who, who's doing that kind of behavior and map that, um, understand who, who is clicking on links, who's reporting and use that data to then send out your intervention or training a link, a resource, whatever, whatever it is that you're going to um, send out and then test it at the other end. Send them another phishing test. Same for people who both got the training and didn't and see if the people who received your intervention, did they improve or not? Um, there have been a lot of really interesting studies in this space. Um, uh, and what they've actually found specifically around training and trainings that relates to phishing, is that there's two categories of people that there are people who will always click on a phishing link and there's people who pretty much will never click on a phishing link. And the training that you give them is going to be almost irrelevant. There are people who will actually look through the training, ignore the whole thing and proceed to click on every phishing link thereafter. Mm -hmm. And there's people who never see the training and will never click on the link. And it's kind of a preset notion of like, I either think phishing is a problem and I will course correct to, to not do that behavior or I don't give a damn about this. Which is where my point is, is that we actually need to move away from training as the resource around this. And, and this is where I was sort of hinting this a little bit. It's not that people don't know that they shouldn't be clicking on links. It's just, they don't care. They don't care. They don't think it's part of their job. They don't think they, they need to be bothered. They think there's a security team that's got their back and they can click on things with all day long. And the Delta is not telling them in another funny video, it's, getting them to care about it in a way that is different than we've ever tried to communicate it before. Hmm. Okay. And then LMS can't do that. That is no. true. That is true. No, even, even if you, even if you try and, uh, uh, you know, like massage the, the canned, uh, you know, security track that they have that comes with it, it's still not going to do that. It's not going to be able to make them care. Do you have any like top, like where would you even start? Yeah. To make so, them care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a great, great question. Um, one of my biggest ahas in my career has been realizing that I can't get somebody outside of security to care about security the way that you and I do. Mm. We as human beings are wired to care about the things we care about. Sometimes it's money, often if you're in sales. Sometimes it's achievement or pride or recognition or winning or competition. 
But security is not really on, on top of those lists. But what I can do is I can tie security to the things you already care about. And through security, if I can get you to achieve the things that are important to you, you'll do security, whatever the security ask is. And so it's kind of a human hack, but um, it's in the same way that like if you're training a dog, a dog doesn't particularly care about not peeing inside your house. They really care about the treats. But if you tie treats to appropriate bathroom behavior, you're good. Like that's, that's what the logic here is. I don't mean to be simplifying all of our employees to dogs and and security to, to, to bathroom training, but it's a simple I mean, example. <laughs> yeah. Some people like milk bones. Some, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, it could work. Um, I'll tell you. I've heard worse comparisons. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. So I'll tell you two things that I found incredibly effective in my career. One of them, so I really enjoy teaching lock picking classes. And what I do is I tie a desired behavior for an organization I'm working with and say patching. Let's say I'm trying to drive a speedy patching of critical vulnerabilities, for example. And the people in the last quarter who have closed bugs within SLA, let's say that's the behavior I want to drive, all of a sudden get access to a lockpicking class that I'm teaching. And a lockpick and the person who has introduced no bugs maybe gets their own lockpick set. And I'll tell you the amount of people who are like, Okay, I got it. You want me to do this behavior and I get access to that class? I'm all about it. The trick here is, is to give someone something that they can't just tie a monetary value to. The lockpicking class has access, it has a concept called access. It's exclusive. I might, I mean, yes, you could probably look it up on, on YouTube, but it feels unique and special. And so tying something that you might not be able to get otherwise and really drives the type of behavior that we want. Mm. Um, Games do this all the time. You get badges, you get rewards, and it incentivizes to run on this loop of, of doing more of that same behavior. Airlines have figured that out. We keep like frequent flyer points, routes us through through airports and and keeps us committed to airlines so we can rack, rack it up. Not necessarily because we care about flying United, but because we care about status. So it ties right. it back into things that are intrinsic to us. Same thing with security. There's a lot of stuff that we can do in that space. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was, um, I'm going through my PMP certification and we talked a little bit about this before the show, but, uh, there, there's def there's different, uh, you're managing people. So they, they talked about motivations, what motivates people and there's different, um, motivation or, or leadership or, 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 you know, models. And one of them's Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory. So one of them, you know, states, what are the motivators? It's, you know, job achievement or recognition, uh, responsibility advancements, growth, you know, the ability to take on additional, um, you know, uh, work, uh, or, you know, you get to work on this cool project or, or what have you. Um, you know, when, when we, we, ha we almost have to tailor the responses though, because for HR, they have to open files. They get emails all the time. So, um, the, the way that a salesperson, for instance, handles email is different than a person who from security who handles email different from the, the C level who handles the email, uh, your, 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 your manager yourself. So, you know, if you got an email from outside from somebody, uh, you know, Hey, look at my resume, you might not be so willing to open it as a person from HR would, if there's a PDF attachment on the end. So how do we, how do we motivate those people to be secure? but still do it within the boundaries of their jobs so that they can continue doing their job. Because if you tell them, Oh, don't, don't click on emails. Or don't click on links in email. Well, I, th this person need, wants a job. I can't, I got to click on this link to be able to do this. And then they're owned. Um, so you tell them to not do their job to be secure and then they can't do their job. And then they, you know, there's stressors there. So how do, how do you, how, how do we, how do we, you know, reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really tricky question. And honestly, telling someone who has to open and click open emails and click on links for their job and their livelihood that they can't do it is the best way to create animosity in an enemy. Right. Um, right. And I can't motivate you to do that. Like your motivation to have a paycheck is greater than your motivation to, to get a milk bone from me. Like right. when, when we compare those two things, I'm not going to win. Um, 
And it's important to realize that it, we have to have empathy for, for the other side. And in this case, it's actually tools and functionality that have to come in uh, and work with the counterparts and say, if you have to do this, let's talk about, let, let's talk about making sure you have 2FA enabled if, if it is a tricky situation or make sure you're, you're up to date and patched and you know what to look for in case things escalate really quickly and you realize, oh, well, that was not a legitimate resume that was sent to me. Um, right. And so you have to you have to work with mitigating circumstances, realizing that that's, that's a requirement. And you, and you can't actually do a one-size-fits-all approach, unfortunately. Um, and in some ways, uh, being able to segment your population and who you're talking to based on, obviously, role is one of them. Um, need is the other, but you can even, you can go even further. This the advertising industry has figured this out, but you know, what does motivate you? If you, if you, if you have come down to motivation, like I found sales and executives love competition while engineers really love elements of achievement and recognizing progress in front of their peers, um, geographies also change. Right. And so, so there's so many things that we know about each individual and if you start tailoring that to how we drive interventions um you you actually start getting much more effect uh from your programs we just haven't ever really put in this level of thoughtfulness and, and sophistication we've done it in advertising we've done it in marketing we've done it for our technical systems but we've never really done this type of approach for for the human element of security which is really a shame because it's a huge vulnerability across every organization it's it's I mean, it depends on what report you read but something like 90 percent of breaches have a human element associated with it so yeah it's about time so having a um, naughty list or a shame list not a good idea what do you think i'm curious um i don't know maybe for some people it would it would motivate them yeah. You know, hey, I don't want to be on the the, the bad list, or uh, you know, next time the um, the ten percent reduction in workforce rolls around, you might be the top of the list, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more links you click on, one time I clicked on a link. I mean, it was very convincing, right? And it happened to be a phishing test, mm -hmm. so I was so angry at myself and and angry at the people sending them, you know, yeah. because it was kind of shameful like that. I wrote a script that actually created nonces similar to the one that it gave the um, fishing company and just pounded it like tens of thousands of times with different nonces. That sounds um, like revenge, Mr. Betcher. Yeah, kind <laughs> it's of. It's an ugly, ugly sweater you wear right there yeah. for revenge, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, th I think it would help maybe internally change like some of the more targeted program stuff, maybe. I don't know. It has to be more carrot than stick, I think, too. You know, you want you want people to, you know, feel good about doing good things or maybe if not maybe up. not let them know that there's a naughty list. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean you wanna you it's all about, you know, if they do wrong, you want them to feel comfortable telling you. So yeah. um, you you also need to, you know, when they do something right, then you need to have that carrot as well. Uh, and, the, you know, the stick needs to be, you know, a mild thing, not just, you know, beating them with it. But um, uh, I think we talked a little bit about this a couple of years ago with the reward system. But, um, yeah, I've always been a fan of, of – praising people in public and then, you know, giving them the stick, uh, in, in private so that, yeah. you know, they're not being, you know, berated in front of people. It's not the, not the right way of doing things from a, from a leadership point of view. Yeah. Um, but to, to all your points, there's, so shame is, it's a really powerful technique. Um, I've been in an organization we call the dorking where you leave your computer unlocked and they, you send a fake email on behalf of that person. You do it once and you're good. Like you never do that again. It's very effective, but everyone remembers so viscerally, just like you were saying, Ryan, like that one time it happened to you. And it's like it, the thing that comes up is like revenge and hatred. The behavior gets changed 
but at what cost? And what ends up happening is you get a short-term benefit at the, at the cost of long-term relationship. Mm. And where that long-term relationship gets compromised for the security team is when you really want an employee to say, hey, I made a mistake. Or there's a process here that's coming up and it's kind of weird. Like we're not handling our sensitive data in the way we should be. And if, if the thing that comes up is like, oh yeah, but security is that group of assholes who just... I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on your, on your late, podcast. Too late. Yeah. Our, it's usually Miss <laughs> Berlin. It. It's usually Miss <laughs> Berlin that gives us We've been tagged. A tag, yeah. Bully. Okay. Uh, well, this group of people who are just, uh, who who always try to get me to fail and are setting me up and they're they're shaming me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out of my way to do that. And, and that made that decision made a thousand times over across your organization for every person you've shamed into, you know, not falling for a fish, for example, mm. uh, will cost you uh, significant long-term uh, benefits to your security culture. Um, the UK government, they have an amazing program called the NCSC, I believe it's called. They've done an amazing set of research around how phishing actually damages security culture long term. And they actually do not recommend it as a as an ongoing sustainable program unless you also tie in elements of like reward and recognition. So by doing positive phishing is an opportunity to highlight uh, great, great work. Uh, do you ever recommend that? Phishing? Because of the, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Because of the long-term impact uh, yeah. negative that it could have. Um, I, I do recommend it because it is, it's been shown to be effective in, in dropping down fishing links, but there's a, but there's a two really important things to do this correctly. First is when you send out the program, you announce why you're doing it. It is to test, to train. It is not to shame you. It is giving you skills and opportunity for detection and for practice. It is not uh, like and saying what happens to your name if if you do fall for it like what what is the the impact of that so making it safe to fail and then the opposite the end category is when you do get that fish it's not just an opportunity to fail but it is also an opportunity to succeed and to highlight good behavior mm. so when people do report things reply to them cc their manager and say you caught this one this was a difficulty level four out of five thank you so much for being a security mindful employee you rock um and so it's not just opportunities for negative reinforcement it's opportunities for positive ones as well and those two bookmarks are the things that make it safe to practice as long as you call it that and the practice is for something like we're all in this together. There's attackers greater than us. We're all developing these skill sets. Not if you do this, you will fail. Right. Why, why do you think that the human side of security stymies the security teams at companies so often? Is it because we're not by nature interactive people? Like if we had more salespeople or if we talked to the PR people, their marketing people, could we use them as the instrument to get our point across or are we now having to explain to the salespeople or the marketing people why we want the rest of the company to do x y and z yeah um i think you hit upon a really other interesting pain point i think we have in security is security is has historically been brought up by or has been created as an industry by really technical people and we keep thinking that it's a technical problem and a lot of it is but at the end of every technical system is a human being and human beings cannot be solved with the same amount, uh, same technical approach as, as our systems do. And there are skill sets in this space that are excellent at it. So uh, psychologists are, are one of them, behavioral science, behavioral change experts. Um, and some of the skills that you were just talking about really require an understanding of empathy and conversation communication is part of it. But a lot of what I'm talking about is organizational change and behavioral psychology. Uh, and I think one of the reasons we fall short as an industry is because we think it's a technical problem. We put someone who has run uh, incident response on an awareness program, or the alternative, we think it's just a training problem. So we put someone who's a, like has experienced an HR on security. It's, it's a risk management and a psychology problem. And it's a combination of the two. And in some ways it's actually, 
a phenomenal mix of like left and right brain work. Um, and teams, the most successful teams that I've seen that address this effectively have a mix of a whole bunch of different skill sets. People who are really into the data sets, people who are really into understanding how and why people make risk decisions and how to communicate it effectively. Um, and then people who are really interested in the content and be like, okay, well, in this situation and based on this data, this is what needs to get communicated to. And it's the combination of those three things that help with the outbound communication and empathy for the sales team, the marketing team, and whoever, whoever we need to, we need to get on board. Right. Okay. You ever use humor? For example, funny videos. Hey, you got to watch this video, but it's pretty great. Do you, do you like funny videos? Sure. Yeah. Who doesn't? Do you, does it help you watch the video to the end? I'm, I'm assuming it does, yeah. <clears throat> they just um, relay security concepts, like don't leave your computer open, or you mm -hmm. know, when you take this phone call, you have to verify if it has anything to do with money. But they do it yeah. in a humorous, humorous way. way. I've yeah. seen that. Yeah. yeah. So humor is a really great way to drive engagement and really helps get people through to the end of the content. What we still fail to see in the element of humor, with humorous videos or humor in any capacity, is does it actually impact the behavior the way we want it to? And what ends up happening is even funny videos are still videos. And videos are a form of audiovisual information that according to learning pyramids have something like 15% of your retention rate. So even funny videos that you watch to the end, your mind cannot retain that information, especially in highly stressful situations, more than 15% of that information. Um, so uh, the, it's, the medium itself is, is one of the issues. And the second thing is I can watch a funny video and I can laugh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that when I'm uh, in the middle of running between meetings or really stressed out, will I actually click on a link less? Do I have the tools? Do I have the ability? Do I have the motivation? Um, funny videos uh, address the engagement of the video, but not actually the core behavior. So you said they retain about 15% from an, uh, a video. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the 85% retention rate isn't a 300 page policy that, <laughs> you know, they require people to read or like a certain company that I've, I've been working for in the past where it's a simple one page policy document with 25 links to 15 other pages that you have to, you know, sub, sub, sub page down through, uh, which just makes me want to hurt people. What is the ideal format to help motivate people or, you know, if, if it isn't funny cat videos talking about locking your computer? Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, what, what would you guess is the, is the ideal form of, of transferring information to get someone to remember it? Well, my PMP would tell me face-to-face -face interactive communications, but uh, mm -hmm. I, you know. Uh, yeah. Discussions have something like 70% retention rate. Mm. De demos are about 50%. Discussions are 70. Number one uh, is teaching. 80% hmm. is learning by doing. And then 90% and is if you have to get up and teach somebody else you'll remember it yourself because you truly have to, I have to grok it. Okay. That would, that would make sense if you learn by doing or you learn by teaching others. Uh, I, I found myself stuck on a, a problem and by the time I explain it to somebody else, I figured out what my problem was. So there it uh, is. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thought there. So you want to make we, you, the Royal, you, you want to make training more interactive and in, you know, bring people in. We did this a lot in Navy. We had, uh, instead of our annual security training, we would have an all day training workshop and it would be on security training and then there'd be anti-terrorism training portions in there. And it would be a bunch of people talking and, you know, with a bunch of slides and, and, and doing that. And, and I think it was better than, what we normally would get, especially uh, what we've seen in the last few years. But 
is um, is there any set length to this? Uh, obviously, a, a day long is probably too much, and fifteen minutes is not enough. Is there is there is there a point at which it's like, okay, yeah, that's you know, you're starting to lose people at, at that point, or you know, maybe you need to go a little bit further. Is there is there a sweet spot in 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 how you know the training would motivate people or retention purposes? Remember the the question I rephrased back at the very beginning is well how much is enough is enough training right yep it's not the right question it's the question is what do you want to happen at the end of the training if and honestly it doesn't even have to be training like if I can get one takeaway for all of you it, 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 listening is that it's quite possible that your employees have been trained enough they're not doing it because the training isn't funny or isn't long enough or isn't interactive enough. It's because they're not bought into it. I'd mm. like to share a little bit of a, um, studies, a results from a study that we just uh, ran. And what we found, so we, we took a whole bunch of people who uh, were low performers in fishing. And we uh, actually were both low and high performers. And for the high performers, we sent out an email and says, you are an excellent performer and fishing. And what we did for both groups, actually, is we compared their performance to their peers, the people in their department, to the rest of their organization, and to the person who best, the best performer in their org. And this is a concept in behavioral science called social proof. Can I compare how I'm doing to my peers? It's the same idea that, you know, your five-star reviews work on Amazon and Yelp tells you where to go for dinner. And when you see a famous um, celebrity buying um, like a product, you're like, oh, well, it's good for all these people. It must be good for me. So it's a concept of social proof because as human beings, we're all about herd mentality. Like, mm -hmm. oh, the, the herd is doing it. It must be safe. It must be good. So for people who were not doing great at fishing and, and were clicking and compromising themselves. We compared their specific performance using data compared to the rest of their department, their peers, and the best in class. So let's say you were not doing great. We said, hey, do you know, Brian, you're actually three times more likely to click on a link and a phishing email than the rest of the people in your department. That message alone, so we saw a decrease in compromise rates by 83% across the, the organization. Uh, we also, for, for all those people, also included a link that said, if you would like to learn more, or here are the things you need to know to strengthen your skills. So it's a specific targeted training for that. People clicked on that training link 1%, 1%. So, so it was not the training. People didn't really engage. Like, yeah, I don't actually care. And it wasn't the training that was necessary to get people to change their behavior. In fact, we did not, we found that even the people who actually took the training, it had no effect um, compared to people who didn't take the training. We, the, the thing that was truly most motivating and getting a significant part of this population, we were talking about, um, this was a, uh, a base of 10,000 people. So it was statistically significant um, that it was the social proof. Tell me why I should even care about this behavior and then I'll step up and do it differently. Hmm. Um, and which is the point where I'm saying the training doesn't matter. People are just going to mute it and skip to the end. And if you're going to put out a training, make it short. So it's less, less to skip towards the end, right. but make it small, make it relevant. But uh, if you're going to do it, but really the core question you should be asking is what is the behavior I want to drive and why are people not doing it? And I would, I can tell you with, with clear data that's giving them training is not going to be the thing that's going to change it. It's going to be getting them to mo motivate themselves by in. And one of the easiest way to do it is, is compare performance to your peer and say, you're, you're below the bar and this is what you need to get to the bar. Is that a white paper y'all made or a st uh, is there a link somewhere where we yeah. can put that in the I have a blog notes? post I can, I'm happy to share. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, would that, was that, was that made by Elevate in this case? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so one of one of the things that came up uh, in the in the discussion that I had with the pre-wiring this was it said security teams have installed tons of security tooling that can give insights into how the employees are behaving. Um, I what kind of security tooling do we have installed in our enterprise that could be used to discuss 
cust, uh, you know, user behavior. And I'm assuming it's, you're not talking like a CASB th- type solution where we're tracking people or, um, is that something exactly you're shaking your head? Yes. I'm shaking my so, head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So most of the time we think about, it, um, user behavior as efficient click through and training. That's the two, two sets of, uh, metrics we have. And that's so limited because human risk applies to so many other categories. And one of the things that I find, uh, really disappointing is how much data security teams already have available to them to start getting insights into human risk. So let's take your endpoint protection. That gives you insight into who's going to need more more training on malware, for example. If you have people who are regularly have to be have interventions from endpoint protection because they're they're downloading and attempting execution on on their machine, those people definitely need some malware uh, training or, or motivation. Uh, how about sensitive data handling? So you can absolutely look into things like DLP solution or CASB uh, about who, who's needed to have um, technology interventions for mishandling information or oversharing, for example. Um, you can look into securely using internet so um, and safe browsing. How about proxies? How many, which of your employees have gone to websites that have been blocked um, or have accepted risks uh, and said, yeah, this is great. I can move forward. All of that is information that helps you triangulate whether or not a, someone is is introducing risk in your in your network. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also s- worked with um, VPN usage, like who's using a VPN to connect to your environment, who isn't. Uh, MFA adoption. Um, do people have it installed or not? Are they using a token versus um, the SMS push? Um, those are all really core core and critical behaviors we can start driving and really help provide insight into to organizations. Same thing with real phishing, right? Do people yeah. click on um, phishing attacks that that after the fact have been have been deemed malicious. You can find Masha Sadova on Twitter at mod Masha M O D M A S H A and you can visit her company's website at elevatesecurity.com. That was our show for this week. You can find show notes for this and all of our shows at www.breakingsecurity.com. You can also find an RSS link uh, on the site to add to your favorite podcatcher. You can find all of us on Twitter. Miss Berlin can be found at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Mr. Betcher can be found at Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. We have a Slack. Come join us on our Slack. A lot of great things going on there. A lot of channels of various InfoSec-related subjects. You can get an invite on Twitter by emailing our official Twitter uh, handle for the show at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Or you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for their monetary assistance by offsetting costs involved in putting out a weekly show. Zoom fees, Libsyn hosting, domain purchase, uh, renewal, uh, equipment upgrades, uh, time and effort building the community we have. Uh, We appreciate all of your help and support. If you'd like a t-shirt, stickers, coffee mug, or just to show your support for the show, you can check out our TPUB site www.tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash BDS podcast. We thrive on your feedback. Uh, A quick five-star comment on iTunes or Google Play Store or your favorite streaming service, Spotify, Pandora, what have you, uh, go a long way to uh, gaining us additional visibility. It takes no time at all, and we we appreciate uh, your help in spreading the word. That was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Be safe, be well, be kind to one another. Take care of yourself because you're the only you you have. And we'll talk to you again soon.